through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Uh, you probably think now that you're in the wrong class. Uh, what in the world are you reading a passage on baptism for this? Well, yes, uh, this is on uh, baptism. But um, baptism is not the thrust of the passage. Uh, we, in the way that we have taught it, uh, have made it the thrust of the passage um, because we had something that we wanted to say. But that is not really the thrust of what this is all about. You read this in the context of the entire book of Romans, especially the first eight chapters, you realize that the thrust of the passage is how can we become new people in Christ? How can we not only look like, but live like children of God? If we're going to be called children of God, how do we really act like that? How do we really be that? And so Paul is, is using baptism to illustrate the thing at which we make that change, that transition from our old life of sinfulness, self-centeredness, selfishness, and self-worship to a life that is focused on Christ and with that life focused on Christ then it is a life that is able to serve and please him because the people are living like children of God. So I want to read the rest of this passage and read it with this context now in mind. All right? Sort of listen to what he's saying, not just the baptism part, but listen to what he's saying about what happens to us. Let me begin reading now at verse 5 in continuation. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his death. Resurrection. For we know that our old we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. That we should so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to the sin once. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, to that old life, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin, don't let that old life reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, 
but under grace. To me, that, that describes in very beautiful words what it means to have a good self-image. That all of that life that I used to live in my uh, sinfulness, in, in the bad relationships that I had, in, in, in not liking myself, in, in living my life in, in ways that were self-destructive and destructive to others. And now God has taken me and changed that and has given to me a new way of living, a new self. And my task is to see my new self image through the, not through the eyes of people around me who would want to tear me down. I think that's so important. It is especially important then when we come to dealing with our families. So we introduce with that our, our thoughts for the day. Um, we're going to be, be finished, uh, unfortunately yesterday I didn't realize our time parameters, so we're going to be finished at 10 too. So we want to give you at least 10, hopefully 15 minutes at the end for questions. So as we go through, if you have any questions or anything, jot them down and we'll give you opportunity to ask those at the conclusion. Now yesterday we talked about what self-image is. Now then we want to talk today about how family develops self-image in all of the members of the family. Not but how everybody operates in developing the self-image of everyone. Uh, I thought uh, Mike's lesson this morning was excellent in that. If you didn't hear that, you missed uh, just a marvelous lesson. Uh, excellent in how family operates in building each other's self-esteem. And that family of Isaac's wasn't, didn't have very good self-image. Okay, what is a healthy family? A healthy family is a survival and growth unit. It's a place where everybody is growing, and especially we want to talk about growing in our feelings of being a valuable person. You know, when we get married, most of us have no training for being married. It's our first experience, so what we do know is what we have learned from the generation ahead, perhaps. And a lot of times what we learn wasn't a very healthy thing. And so we have to unlearn some of the things that we learned that were uh, unhealthy, things in relation, relating to each other that were not good, and start over almost completely a lot of times. One of the things that we see a lot is people who don't want to unlearn. They are, they are comfortable, I guess is the word. Uncomfortable, but comfortable in the patterns that have been established within their family of origin. But it should be a time where we all grow together and help each other to grow. Number two, a healthy family is the soil which provides the emotional needs of all the family. Now I think in our culture that's a difficult one for us. Inasmuch as our culture is a culture which has denied its emotions. We, we as a people, as a whole, have not known very well how to deal with our emotions. Now, in the, in the overall, I think uh, women have been allowed a little more freeway, leeway, to uh, deal openly with their emotions than males have. Somehow in our um, uh, North American and actually Western world culture, we, uh, we have equated emotions with weakness. If you want to be strong, you have to be without emotions. 
And uh, that, uh, that idea dominates the business world even yet today, and, and, and much of society as a whole. One of the things that I deal with a lot in counseling up there is men who have been run through the uh, corporate mill and have been totally chewed up. They're burned out. And the first thing you find is that they are completely, totally out of touch with all of their feelings. And uh, you say to them, well, one of the first things we're going to have to do is to help you get in touch with your feelings. And their wives say, Yahoo! <laughs> because they've been telling them that for years, and they've been saying, no way. Feelings are weak. <laughs> but you see, family has to acknowledge its feelings. And that's, that's the soil in which that's done. And it provides for the growth and development of each person in the family. Sometimes we think that as parents, our job is to help the growth of the children. But we need to be concentrate as much on our own growth as we do on the growth of our children. Uh, I think it's wonderful that we get a chance to grow up with our children. Some of us were so immature when we started having children that we really needed to grow up. And it's just wonderful. Some of the greatest lessons that I have learned have been from my children. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, a healthy family is the place where the attainment of self-esteem takes place. It's also the place where more than anywhere else, if that child does not develop a healthy self-esteem, it will be because of the neglect of the family. Um, one of the uh, issues that uh, uh, psychology is starting to deal with a lot that we in the realm of theology have not done a great deal with yet, and we need to. Uh, it's unfortunate that psychology is ahead of us in dealing with this area. And this is in dealing with people's sense of shame. You see, there's, for a long time, we've, we've struggled with this area of guilt. We say, well, there's healthy guilt, and then there's unhealthy guilt, and we haven't known what to call that unhealthy guilt. I think basically now we've, we recognize it's, it's a deep, if my mom said to me, what you did, was bad. That produces guilt. If my mom said to me, you are bad, that doesn't produce guilt. That produces shame. You see, it's very, very different to make a mistake in life than to be a mistake. And very often that's, that's what families teach their children, that they are deeply shamed people. It's not the children who are the shamed people, it's the parent who carry it. And every one of us, in all probability, have carried as some shame from our early childhood training. But that not, that's not what a healthy family will do. It, it's the place where healthy children. And it's the major unit for our socialization, and it has to be a good, healthy thing if our society is to endure. Uh, we've all wept over the falling apart of the family, I'm sure. And uh, it's just so important, particularly that we, who are the family of God, work to make sure that we have healthy, healthy families and that we have a healthy attitude about what the family is all about. Um, yesterday in Lagarde Smith's 
uh, talk, he talked about how we change our terminology and it changes our ability. When I hear people make statements like, this is a marriage that just cannot continue. There's no way this marriage can continue. There's no of terminology instead of saying the truth and saying, this is a family that one or both partners have chosen not to stay together. It's not that they can't, it's that they choose not to. So with that introduction to what a, a healthy family is, but one of the questions that arises is, how, how does the family pass on to, its, uh, to the children, particularly? How do parents pass on to children? A healthy self-concept. Yesterday we looked at the three things. A healthy self-image, a healthy self-acceptance. How, how do we do that? Well, in, in, in trying to sort a lot of this out in in the psychological research that's been done, it's, it seems that there's some dominant patterns that take place in this. For one, the three, three of the key areas, they're not the totality of it, three key areas in a child's developing self-concept is their sense of worth, their sense of identity of who they are and their sense of adequacy what they can do as a person and I, I think we've all seen how these operate you you go into a school and and you look at the kids who are really doing well and the, the kids who are not doing well our logical reasoning would say the kids who are doing well have high self IQs or have high IQs the kids who are not doing well have very poor IQs that's not true sometimes the kids who are doing the poorest have some of the best IQs but they don't have the self image to enable them to have so let's, let's look at these Our feeling that I am loved comes from both of our parents equally. It doesn't make that much difference. Mom and dad both really contribute to that. Um, there are so many things involved in I feel loved. I grew up never hearing the words I, I love you from my parents. I think the first time I ever heard I love you from my dad was after I'd lived in Canada, about 10 years. And I used to say when I finished a telephone conversation, Dad, I love you, and he'd go, mm. And then one day he said, kind of muffled voice, I love you too, and I nearly died of shock. But it was a wonderful feeling. However, I have to tell you that I never, never doubted that my parents loved me and that they, to the best of their ability, were helping me in the ways that they saw as the ways to show love to a child. There is a difference today in that we live in a very high pressure, very busy, overscheduled world, and there isn't the amount of time to sit around the dinner table or to sit around the fire after supper and share family. I grew up on a farm in a small town, and our wintertime routine was to have dinner, and then my dad would read to us for an hour or something like that out of whatever classic he happened to be interested in right at the moment. And we sat on his lap while he read and so forth. There was lots of together time. Not many families take that or make that together time now. And because there is so much uh, verbal stuff coming at us from every way, I think the need to say, I love you to our children has just multiplied by many, many times over what it was for people when it was much lower, more relaxed. Uh, society. I feel the same thing about husbands and wives. I feel like it's so much more important to verbalize I love you than it probably was 
50 or 100 years ago or whatever when the old Scottish fella, and I hope I'm not picking on somebody's uh, ethnic origin, but when he married his wife and 40 years later she said, you know, you never tell me you love me. And he said, I told you 40 years ago and if I change my mind I'll tell you again. Well, that probably worked reasonably well when they were together all the time and, and had so much less in the way of distractions. Today it's very important for us to build self-esteem by saying, I love you. 14 the, times a day. Yes. <laughs> um, incidentally, uh, that 14 times a day is, is real. That comes from J Dr. Virginia Satir, who said that for just bare minimum maintenance, you need to have at least three. three. Fourteen, I thought. No. Oh, for bare maintenance. Sorry. For bare maintenance. I back up. For, for moderate growth, you need eight a day. For maximum growth, you need at least fourteen. And some of us need a lot more than that. <laughs> well, and, you know, and, and the question is, uh, uh, you know, have you gotten your strokes today? Um... Maybe even more important, have you given them today? That's important. All right, number two is the area of identity. One of the things that's very important as parents to give our children is a sense of identity, which means, a, which is a feeling of importance that I am special. Held needs to be special. I, I love the piece that was written some years ago when said, uh, which one of us do you love the most? And she said, well, I love Jane the most because she's the oldest. A and I love Susie the most because she helps me. And I love uh, Peter the most because he tries so hard, and I love Sammy the most because he's the youngest. I like that, you see. And, and what that says is, I see the strengths of all of you, and that makes me love all of you equally, and that's the most. I think it's important for children to feel that, that they have that identity and that they are special. Um, and that primarily comes from the opposite sex parent. So to you mothers, the, your, your son's sense of identity will to a significant degree come from you. The first love that your sons will have is you. And to uh, uh, the daughters, the first love that they will have is you dads. And that's really, that, that came home very vividly to me because we had four daughters uh, before we ever had any boys. We were just on the verge of giving up. And uh, then, um, uh, well, we had some accidents. And uh, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I want to interrupt you. Uh, our biggest accident is sitting right back there on the third road. Stand up, road. Jay, stand up and let them meet. This is Jay Hawkins. And... Uh, one of the nicest accidents that ever happened. Really exciting to see the difference in a little boy and little girls. And uh, I think the, the love affair that a little boy has is with, with his mother is very important to mom. That's not fair, because we don't <laughs> have any of our daughters here. <laughs> <laughs> um. And the last one that we have here is the adequacy, the competency, the feeling of I can do it, and to a large degree that comes from the same-sex parents. Well, and a lot of what happens 
is probably partly that you you do things that are that fit with your sex more with the parent of the same sex the little girl coming in the kitchen and baking with her mom uh, little boy going out and hammering nails with his dad and I know we're crossing boundaries today more and more in those areas and that's wonderful uh, but I think there still will be that ident identification that I can do it from being with the person that you are modeling yourself after the person of the same sex so so as as we talk about that what what are we trying to do what are we what do we want our children to have well I, I mentioned but dr. Virginia Zatir a minute ago and she says that the most important things we recognize as parents is that we give to our children five powers that they must have if they're going to be adequate and competent in competing in our world. Whether you like the idea of competition or not, uh, that's the name of the game. Um, more and more, as, uh, as I work with people, say, in, in the area of employment and helping them get jobs and so forth, they will say, you know, <laughs> uh, we're down, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to get a job with this particular company, and they've weeded it out now to 300 of us for this job. And if I'm going to get that job, I've got to compete with 300 people and show them I'm better. That's the name of the game today. I don't like it, but that's where we are. And so if children are going to be able to compete in that world, and we see so many who can't, they have to have the power to know. Turn your children's knowledge off. You see, that's invariably both an addictive and abusive home. So uh, dad comes home drunk late at night and he creates a real ruckus, you know, about two o'clock in the morning and shouts and screams and hollers and beats up mom and so forth. And, and uh, so the child gets up in the morning and says, uh, what was all the banging around that I heard last night? Is dad drunk? No. Shut up. Don't talk about it. And what you're telling the child is, knowing is bad. Now think what that's going to do to the child for the rest of his life. The child has a right to know, to love, to know how to love, to feel, and the only way he's going to learn to know how to feel and to experience and deal with his own emotions is to be taught that by parents who know how to feel and to want and decide desire desire and to imagine to imagine you know have you ever heard a child say when I grow up I'm going to be a jet pilot and dad says stupid kid you'll never do that and then he wonders why he has a hard time holding down jobs when he's 20 and 30 and 40 So how do we do that? How do we help a child obtain those qualities in his life? And this is the most important thing we're saying today. Here are the things in the child's development that they need most of all from their parents. Six things. They need to be mirrored from the time they're a tiny baby. The very way we touch a little baby has a lot to do with our mirroring of them and our affirming them. Uh, I remember a long time ago going to a conference showing the different ways mothers fed their babies. And, you know, one mom had her book up between her face and the child's face and somehow God knew when he created the distance between a mother's breast and her face exactly how far a child's eyes could 
could uh, see at the very early stage, and he did that for a purpose, but if we put something between us, we have cut off the very purpose for that. Uh, one mother was letting her cigarette dangle out of her mouth. One mother was watching TV, and the baby's eyes keep focusing on mom's eyes, but there is no mirroring, no acknowledging that here is this precious child that I should be m nurturing and molding right at this moment, but instead I'm using the child tells you something, we mirror, mirror and reflect that to them and affirm that they are important by hearing what they are saying. Uh, it's just so important that they recognize that you are noticing what's happening to them. And somebody asked yesterday about spoiling. I think that that does exactly the opposite of spoiling. It just makes the child feel like, yes, I am a worthwhile being and I'm important to this lady that I call my mom or this man I call my dad. It starts so early and we just can't emphasize enough the need for that touching and handling and so forth. And I think that's next. <laughs> no, touching is an important part of that. Um, the, the sense of touch is, is probably the, one of the most important things that we give to each other as, as adult human beings. Um, you know, we... We're, we're learning as a, it's not just a long fishy handshake, but, but we're hugging and, and, and we're nurturing each other, and I think that's marvelous. But especially to children, they need it so much. And as the, especially from, from very, very young, children need touching. You know, the Indian uh, culture was so... Uh, wise in the way they raised their children right next to her and healed or whatever it was that child was always right next to her body and to me that's they understood something that somehow we in our culture had intellectualized ourselves out of now we're starting to understand again how important it is but touch. you mentioned children it's very right. important for husbands and wives to touch too. Yes. Jim and I will have been married 40 years in December and the sense of touch is still so very powerful in our relationship. I know always when he's anywhere in the vicinity that I am and you know just even brushing past that has such a warm wonderful feeling to me. And I just think it's the most important thing that we never withhold touch because we're angry or because uh, something has upset us. Touching has a powerful communication. Oh, it's, it's the most powerful communication. And number three? Okay, and our, chi our child and our mate needs uh, selfness, self-value, self-acceptance, and self-actualization. We need to really feel like the people in our family think that we can do it. One of the good things in my married life has been that Jim has always believed I could do anything. I mean, he's been terribly wrong sometimes, but he has always believed that I could do anything. I'll tell you a couple of examples that uh, he decided he wanted a knitted sweater, and so he went out and bought a pattern, wool, and needles, and gave them to me. I said, I don't know how to knit, and he said, yeah, but you can learn. You can do anything. Guess what this crazy gal did? She learned to knit because he believed I could. The same thing, he wanted a sport jacket one time, and we were very hard up, and so he bought the fabric and the pattern, and I made him a sport jacket that he wore for many you do something is such a motivator for doing it. I hope that I have done that with my children, really believe that they could do what they, that they set out to do and encourage them. Sometimes it's hard not to get in the way when you think your child may be making a financial decision that's not going to be good for their future, or taking a job that may not be the best job for what they need, or whatever. But the best thing that I can do as a parent or as a wife is to back off and say, go with it. I'm sure you'll learn something from it even if you don't, if you aren't able to do what you set out to do. You'll at least learn a lesson in the process. 
then one of the things that uh, the child needs to learn is a sense of autonomy. As the child begins life, they, they only see themselves as an extension of their mother. They and their mother really are one. But then as they grow, they begin, that, that differentiation begins to grow if it's a healthy relationship. And uh, that sense of autonomy and difference and space and separation is such an important thing. The, the healthily differentiated family is, is what is so important. This, the example that was used uh, in the, the lesson this morning of uh, Jacob and Esau was that here were two boys who did not have healthy differentiation from their parents. Jacob with uh, his mom, Esau with his dad. They weren't healthily differentiated there. And so there was an enmeshment in that that was tough. Um, you know, we use these terms with families and, and, and they, they very often don't know, you know, whether they're differentiated family or an enmeshed family. And I'll, I'll say, let me ask you a question. Do you have family reunions? <laughs> family reunions? What are you, or three? Well, uh, their differentiation is so bad that you see they can't even be together. If they say, oh yes, we have family, uh, family uh, reunions all the time. And I say, okay, tell me this. What happens when it's time to go? Is it easy to leave? And if it's a mesh family, they say, huh, uh, no. Uh, in fact, it's awful to leave. Because we know that if we're the first ones to leave, we know what everybody else that's left there is going to do. They're going to talk about us. And so you see, there hasn't been a healthy sense of autonomy and space and separation. Healthily, if you've developed that, you can move together and that be beautiful. And then you can move back apart and you're still whole and healthy people and loved and cared for by your family that you've just left. That's healthy family. And you need to feel pleasure, pain, and stimulation. It's really important not to try to spare members of the family from either the pleasures that they feel or the pain that they feel. Uh, I grew up in a family where on my father's side of the family you were not allowed to grieve. You were supposed to just forget it when someone died and that was the end of the story. And. Uh, so we didn't get to really feel the pain the way that we needed to feel the pain. We didn't get to feel the anger that goes with death and so forth. It just wasn't to be. Now when daddy was gone and the members of his family were gone, you could feel it with mom and that was okay. But it was unhealthy for it to be confined to just one parent. Really important that we encourage people to feel their feelings of pain and pleasure. And then last is the area of dependability and predictability. Children will learn whether they live in a dependable and predictable world primarily through the family of origin. And if, if, if they learn that world and life and people are not dependable and they're not predictable, they have been set up to fail in their life. Because one of, the, one of the most important things we can give to our children is, is a sense that whatever happens, we're there. Yes, you might fail. You, you may not do what you really want to do. You may not get that A in, in school. You may not make the... Um, uh, chorus, whatever it is that you're trying to do. You may not make the drama club. You may, whatever. But that's okay. And mom and dad are with you and will encourage you. And that's, and there's nothing that can give to a person a greater sense of healthy self 
self-image and self-esteem and self-acceptance than knowing that they live in a world that's dependable and predictable. And even though all the world isn't always that way, to know that when I go back home, it is. I have a place to put my feet back on the ground and get my bearings again. And that's what family, healthy family is. And that's the place where healthy self-image is developed. And we have just barely touched the hem of what we would like to cover today, but the time is up and we said we'd give you a few moments to ask some questions, so you have that opportunity now. Maybe a brief answer. Uh, you talked about adequacy, feeling of competency, coming from same-sex parent. Can you just talk about you know, just a few strategies as how you can help your children develop that sense of adequacy and competency? What are some things you can do or say to help that? Okay, primarily what I would say is really important is that whatever your child sets out to do, you recognize what they did, not what they didn't do. In other words, if my child brings me a picture and I say, oh, you forgot to put the arms on the little girl that you drew here, we have said, you're not really a competent person. But rather, if you say you want to tell me about your picture and then comment on the beautiful colors they've used or whatever there is to, uh, that's worthwhile to praise, and children know when praise is undeserved. So we want to be very careful that we don't just give them flattery but give them honest, honest praise. sincere praise. That would be one thing. Another thing is to encourage them to try things that they might, uh, you know, come up that sound like a fantasy almost. One of the things I think about is we had uh, our other son uh, had a great way of dreaming, and I didn't really realize the need to go along with the dream and give him his wish or whatever it was in fantasy, like he'd say, Boy, I think that for Christmas I'm going to get, and he would say something that was so far out of our financial ability, and I would try to bring him down to earth by saying, well, I don't think that we can afford that, or I don't think it's likely you're going to get that. If I had that to do over, I would say, wow, that sounds exciting. What would you do with it if you had it? And let him have it in fantasy like that they're not crazy, that they're not doing something they'd like to have. In this that is, as you, as you work... Uh, say around the house or whatever it is, in, incorporate your children into that activity. Uh, the more children work with you and share, you know, I mean, um, uh, Rubel Shelley was talking that doesn't stay cut, you know, <laughs> and so you're having to do that job again, you know. Um, let, let all the family be a part of that. You know, share that. <laughs> Jay knows about that, don't you, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's why he's such a good guy. <laughs> One more question, way back at the back. Uh, what happens if you have one child who's very dominant and tends to revel with the other child, and you try to maybe take the moderate road, and the one child who gets ran over thinks you're not supporting her? So when you have a dominant child and one who is a little more laid back and the dominant child sort of controls the younger one right. and well, you don't completely take the other one's side, she thinks, well, you're, you know, you're not helping yeah. me. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that we have a daughter that I think is very clever when it comes to dealing with her children. She probably is, should be up here teaching instead of me when it comes to the children part. Anything that comes up where one child, where two children are not getting along, and this started when the younger one would be only two, she would say, it seems like you two have a problem. I give you permission to go in my office and work it out, and when you're finished, come tell me what you did. And the first time I saw that, I go, why, the older one's going to beat the younger one to a pulp. This is a stupid thing to do. Not so. No, not so. It is very quick that the younger one learn to take up for themselves and to ask for what they want and tell the other one what they need. And these children have learned the art of negotiation. She has four, so there's quite an age range there. They've learned the art of negotiation that a lot of us didn't learn and maybe still haven't, even as adults. They're more adept at it than most adults that we see. Uh -huh. But the interesting thing, if I say this, was, you know, I said, um, you know, the, the youngest one, 
you know, she's going to get run over. And she says, yeah, she did for the first time or two. And then, boy, I'll tell you what, her back straightened up, and the next time they went in the office to negotiate, she was ready for him. And you see, that's what needed to happen, that she was willing to take responsibility for this thing and say, no more. And the interesting thing, if they come out and it isn't really settled, Kathy just says, I think you need to go back and finish this. It sounds like you are not completed with what you went in the office to do. That just amazed me. But do you know what that does? It gives those kids a great sense of competency. Mom thinks I can take care of myself, even though I am six years younger than my older brother. Good building stone. Thank you. Well, 